from the side, if you will, by tackling these other areas where we desperately need government to work better and to deliver better services. So as you think about opportunities for open government and open data, as I think is the case in Moldova's focus on combining both open government and better delivery of services, we have to start by focusing not so much on the horizontal issues, the issues merely of transparency or of openness per se, but on the vertical issues, the topics that people care about most when they get up in the morning and they go to sleep at night that will motivate them to get engaged and participate, whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's the environment, any of these topics, this is the way to start the collaboration between governments and citizens to demonstrate the value of open data and of citizens working with that data to develop new tools, to develop new ways of working that work better. Because it's only through those kinds of demonstration projects that we will better understand and show to those in power that we can work together, that we can create more collaboration in government. It's not the solution by itself. We do need to tackle these problems through protests. We do need to tackle them head on as well by crying from the rooftops that we need to change some of these bad cultural practices. We we'll create the momentum, we we'll create the ability when we empower people through working on the topics that they care about in ways that they can get involved, in the ways that we can work together to build new culture of government for better delivery of services, for better uh, collaboration and changing the relationship between government and citizens, which in my view will ultimately lead, not just in the long run, but in the short run, to a culture that is more open, that is less corrupt, that is more efficient and that's more effective because we're working together in more open ways, empowered by open data, and empowered by collaboration between government and citizens. I look forward to visiting Moldova in the near future and to continuing the conversation. I wish you a very enjoyable and successful conference, and thank you for letting me join you, at least for a few minutes from abroad. Thanks. Right, it sounds as though uh, Beth Merrick is uh, already packing her bags to get there again, which would be uh, which would be good. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Alex Howard, uh, the government 2.0 correspondent uh, of uh, O'Reilly Media, um, better known to those of us on Twitter as uh, at Digifile, uh, and uh, one of the people that uh, it's an uh, honour to be retweeted by. Um, I never thought I'd be here in person until I found myself sitting next to him this, this morning. Uh, and uh, we've asked him to give a survey from his position uh, with a view of government innovation, open data, open government, open innovation in government 2.0 over the world, or really the state of the world, one of the best examples of innovation coming through, and one of the challenges in the future. So, Alex, can you so it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, as I'm sitting here listening to Beth and I'm going to speak to us all through YouTube, I'm seeing you all tweet about it in real time, seeing the old devices that are letting us all talk to each other about what we're seeing. Uh, it strikes me that that's a really good theme to start off. Um, and I will talk more about themes in terms of what I'm seeing, what I've seen over the past couple of years. Talk about what could be as well as what is. So last year, we were defined by a number of really large macro themes. And what Beth Novak just talked about in terms of the verticals that matter to citizens should matter to us all here in this room, whether we're from the private sector, public sector, media, uh, the civil society world, these things all matter to citizens. And if these initiatives don't matter to citizens, they essentially don't matter as much as they should. Last year was defined by protests in Egypt and throughout our country, throughout the rest of the world. We saw natural disasters. And of course, we saw the effect of the financial crisis uh, both through this country and through my own for the past several years. All these things matter to citizens, and it comes back to what we do here and why it matters. We are increasingly living in this network public square, where all these devices, these technologies, connect us together in unprecedented ways. They provide unprecedented opportunities and challenges for governments and for media and society alike. Um, they create new opportunities to see through each other's eyes and for governments to connect with citizens wherever and whenever they are, to provide services where and when they're needed, and to be held accountable by them in unusual ways as well. 
So how did we get here together? Well, the internet has been around for more than 40 years, but it's safe to say that 20 years ago when the World Wide Web went online and Tim Berners Lee created the opportunity for all of us to make web pages, that something started to happen which is a little bit different. We could all start connecting to each other through hyperlinks and web pages and images and linking. Right. To share knowledge in an academic way that also connected us to one another, not just to governments, not just to businesses, but to each other to see what was happening. <coughs> that accelerated last decade in dramatic ways with really interesting effects in societies which previously had been more closed, which had more constrained knowledge flows, more constrained information, went from scarcity to vast abundance. And vast abundance is what we live in now. We live in a world which is now inundated with more data every year than previously existed before in many senses. Last year we took more pictures than we had in history because all of us have got the technology to take these pictures, all of us now the capacity, if we can afford it, to connect to the internet, which changes the context for how we think about government, how we think about media, how we think about what the role each of those partners plays in society. Unfortunately, and this room knows this, government now is not as smart as it could be. <laughs> it is not as digital as it could be. It is not as connected or automated or it is machine readable. Often knowledge is captured in papers and documents or is released online as these documents does not make it easy for people to use the information, use the data in other places. It also makes it difficult for people in civil society to hold government accountable because what they need to know is buried. So how do we change that? How is that being changed? As we look around the world, as there are pockets of innovation in different countries, there are so many different people working everywhere to try to make this better. Well, there are a number of different ways you can think about it. My publisher, who I went to work for over two years ago, said many years ago that data is the next thing to tell on the side. He borrowed a slogan from uh, one of the quintessential uh, technology companies of the 20th century, Intel, that made the, the computer chips that drive so many of our devices. For them, those, those computers, those chips are very important. For the world today, data is increasingly that huge. It's the raw material that we're weaving together to create the products and services and applications that all of us depend upon increasingly as we conduct our daily lives. In every single sector. Now, if that's true, then that brings us up into some uh, interesting considerations about what's next. But we should take some lessons about what's already happened. When the United States released its weather data, it was thinking about how to help its farmers be more productive and more thoughtful about what's coming. And they, in doing so, created a vast public good. Increasingly, people are seeing that the data that's being collected by government is something that can be used and applied elsewhere in society to significant effect, both for transparency and accountability, the traditional open government world, to increase services, which is what people care about with open data, to economic value, which is what many entrepreneurs are interested in now. There are lessons in how some of technology has developed in that time. When the iPad was introduced two years ago, would anyone have thought that they would have sold 100 million, 100 million of them by now? There are many reasons for this. Steve Jobs gifted us with something that is easy to use, is intuitive, something so easy a young child can access it. But the key is to look at what she's accessing on it. She's using an application. The tablet itself is a platform for innovation. It's not simply a portal that someone comes to. It's not simply a single closed device as so many of our mobile phones were in the last decade. It's an open platform. Now, Apple has to approve the applications that go on to it, so it's not quite as open as you might think, but it is still something that can be made useful in so many different ways. And these applications are driven by data, right? Government didn't build that, but they created the standards and the context for which it could occur. So when we think about these concepts, it's important to separate out what's open government, what's open data, and maybe what's government data, and where they cross over. They aren't necessarily the same thing. And as you think about this conversation around open government, it's certainly in the world, sometimes it's very important to remember that they aren't exactly the same. That governments can release data and yet not be open and accountable to their citizens. They can improve their services and still be autocratic. 
Now, I see Moldovans, your students, your young people, your civil society, striving and crying for a more open government, a more accountable government. We need to understand that services alone will not bring that, but they can help. So, what can be done when government architects themselves to be more open, to be a platform? Well, people can build things on top of it. This application was built for one of our uh, institutions, our, our state senate in New York uh, State, uh, which is the state of my birth. And uh, you may not know, but this particular body um, had corruption issues, and had technology issues, and they built a platform that used open and interoperable technologies that enabled applications to be built on top of it. They made it so that you, citizens could access video and calendars and legislative details and laws. And the same people who were creating these things did as well, the staffers and the legislators. They all used the same platform and the same data. The data that is being released to the world is not just from government, of course. It's also from institutions like the World Bank, who have been uh, kind hosts here. And thank you for doing that. They're releasing data in unprecedented ways to try to open up development, to let citizens and countries know where money is being spent and to start to try to connect at a much more granular level how that money is actually affecting their societies. This is an unprecedented step. We'll see what actually happens down the road. Open data is, of course, being released in many other places that perhaps people years ago could think that might be. And it's having interesting effects. We'll hear more about what's happening in Kenya from speakers later today. But the key here is that when open data is released, it creates the opportunity for citizens to participate in government in a new way, to be generative, to take that data and create things with it, to hold government accountable, to make applications that enable their fellow citizens to do things, and for some entrepreneurs to succeed. Now, data can tell you many things about the world around us. Sometimes it can tell you things like this. This is New York City, and it's graphing out the call that people make to 311. All these calls together start to give you a picture of what the problems of the city are, right? They're not calls for emergency help, they're calls about services and problems and things people are seeing on their streets that they want government to know about. A government collects this data and then makes it available to people to analyze. The city itself analyzes it and can start to understand where some of the problems are and adjust its resources to make better data-driven policy. Now, open data has other rationales as well. One of the important ones that we're still seeing for now is this idea that it can actually reduce costs around Freedom of Information Act requests. As many countries around the world sign up to the Open Government Partnership, some of them are passing new laws that give their citizens the right to ask the government for information. This is a core part of modern democracies. Citizens' right to information about themselves, about government processes that government does not want to give them because it might be embarrassing to show poor performance. And yet it's critical to holding government accountable for the trouble is that it costs a lot of money for government to provide this. System. So the thinking is that if you are open by default, you can reduce the costs that you would incur later on down the road through these requests. This is something that modern democracies can tell you a lot about, how much Freedom of Information Act requests cost. If you are thinking about modernizing, then getting out in front and being open by default will help save money. There's thinking that open data can also help entrepreneurs spur, uh, uh, create new companies, new ways of helping people understand their cities. This is created by a young woman named Leah Budlong in California. Um, this actually gives people information about uh, zoning in their community, something which is very esoteric, but is very important for people who want to build. This is the sort of application that when you release information in various areas that someone can make outside of government and provide information to citizens in a way that government itself may not have been able to do in a uh, beautiful way. And of course, we, we come back to this, right? Internal efficiencies are very important. When government itself creates internal data warehouses of the, of the information it has, it becomes more easy for people in all the government in protected spaces to get the information they need when they need it. The importance of that cannot be underestimated. We had a study in the United States estimate that employees whose jobs require them to search the databases estimate they lost an hour of work every day due to inefficiencies in the system. If you've ever tried to find a document in a huge government bureaucracy, you know this yourself. If you've ever been a person in media and had worked with a huge content management system, you know this yourself. If you've ever been in an academic institution, you know this as well. This is not just about government, it's about all of us. When you make data more open, more easily searchable, it changes the way you can work with it. 
you ever move from uh, an old mail system to a new one where you can instantly search all of your email, you know what I'm talking about. This huge surge of data also provides new business models for journalism. In the first two days here, I spent quite inspiring. There are over uh, a couple blocks looking at young students working with the new tools available to them, extremely powerful tools for processing, story, visualizing, making data uh, contextual for their fellow citizens. This is a new practice of data journalism. Increasingly, this flood is making it possible for anybody who has the skills and access to the internet and the time to make extremely beautiful work. It's not just about print anymore. It's about live stories that update as more information comes into them. This information also can be very important for keeping citizens safe as it's opened up and they're aware of it. Now, there's two ways of thinking about it. You can release data on a government website. People will come to it. In fact, there may be demand for it. Things like health department data, right? When you look at restaurant inspections, and that's important. But one of the principles for data is to help citizens find it where they are, when they are, right? Don't make people find your data. Make it find them. Make it possible for entrepreneurs to pull it into applications. Here's an application that that data has been used in. It uses restaurant inspection data. When someone uses their smartphone to check into a restaurant, it tells them whether it's safe to be there based upon inspection data. The data has been used by a third party and baked into an application so that it's possible for citizens to make a better decision when they're at the point of decision making. This new world is made of data journalists and civic hackers. Sometimes we call them civic coders because hacker is a scary word in government. Instead of doing hackathons, they do codathons. But when they get together, they work with data and they create things that help their fellow citizens do things that they're interested in. And sometimes have fun. In many parts of the world, government has had partnerships with them. They've celebrated them. They've created prizes or contests. You'll hear about apps for Moldova while they're in Europe this week and hear this idea of trying to create more innovation on the data that you have. And in many cases, some of them are trying to do more. They're trying to improve upon what the services that a given city has made. So they take the data, in one case, from uh, where snow plows are, the government's making it available, and they improve the interface. They create a better civic user experience, a better civic user interface on top of government data that allows their fellow citizens to see what's happening for given services, to see what's happening for performance. In this case, you would be able to track the snowplow's progress through the streets of Chicago. Now, last year was quite unusual. It was very warm in the United States. Chicago didn't get a lot of snow. This application didn't get a lot of use. But I'll tell you, in the average year, citizens are very interested in where the plows are and how soon their streets are going to be plowed. And being able to tell government about that, being able to see that, creates new systems for network accountability, which I mentioned before. How do you measure the success of open data? It is a mistake to say we have this many thousand data sets on your website. It is a poor measure. It is an important measure in some context. It is a, uh, a litmus test in some ways to say you've done it. But let's be honest, you could put hundreds of thousands of shape files on your website. What do they do? What has been created from them? What are the downstream impacts of that? Remember those first three slides? Disasters, financial crises, right? Civil unrest. These people don't care if you have a million websites. They don't care if you've got a billion data sets. They care if when they try to get information about a given service they need to get somewhere, it does something for them. And no press release will fix that. No mass media coverage will fix that. They need to get things, and if there are valuable data sets that have been baked into services and systems they already use to make a difference. And here's a perfect example of that. Real-time transit data is a very good story in open data because it is it's valuable data for both entrepreneurs and for citizens. So there's a market incentive to use the data. There's a competitive incentive to build a better application which keeps people actually competing to make better applications. Mm -hmm. And there's a real reason that citizens want to get this information, because they care when the next bus or train is. And oh, by the way, there's also this little bit of transparency bank in there, because people can see that something is supposed to be somewhere, and it's not. Now, there's some psychology here. Citizens actually feel better when they know when the next train is. 
but there's also an important performance measure because government can see how quickly truck trains are, are actually working and whether the systems are clogged or not. Now, one of the best stories in this space is actually health data. There'll be an important event in Washington next week. Uh, our nation's CTO, Chief Technology Officer, has called it the Health Data Palooza. Uh, who, uh, he's riffing off a, a very popular music festival, but behind the name is something that's very important. Two years ago, they launched an effort to make health information as valuable and as liquid as weather data and as GPS data. And as a result of going to entrepreneurs, going out to venture capitalists, marketing it to the communities that would use the data, they now picked it up. And there are 230 applications that either use that data or are entirely founded upon it. It's no longer just a myth or an idea. It has happened. And these are health apps. This is one of the most important areas that you can think of our health care, our children's health, our parents' health. These are things I can talk to my mom about and she'll understand. Many parts of the work, I cannot do that. But I can say, Mom, if you go to this, this will tell you where the nearest clinic is. This will help you with your symptoms. This will help you look up drugs. This will help you find other people who have similar issues that you do and talk to them. This is fundamentally changed the way that people can learn about their health problems and connect with other people and the way that healthcare services can be delivered. It's very important to watch that trend. And here's one of the applications right here. This isn't just for scrappy civic entrepreneurs anymore. This application called iTriage was started by two doctors, emergency room doctors, who saw a need to create a better mobile application. They created it out of hospital data and they created it out of government data. Combined the two together and made something valuable. They then made it an application, and their application got bought by Aetna, one of the biggest healthcare companies in our country. Very important entrepreneurial story. It's also an important one because they've improved the application and now they're rolling it out to their entire system to make those that civic good and public good be available with a market incentive to improve it. I'm going to go a little bit long. Just give a heads up. So, what's smart government? Well, let's go through some things very quickly. Smart government is mobile. If you can afford a cell phone, you have it. Four billion cell phones in the planet. Many more people have cell phones than they have Smart government is built with open standards. GTFS, a standard for transit data, has been adopted by 475 cities around the world. That data is now pulled into Google Maps, which is a killer app. And citizens can simply use it to look and see what the next train or bus is. They don't care that it's open data. They don't know that it came through a, a smarter government initiative. They just know that they know what the next train is when they want to. Smarter government is social. It understands that people are talking about it, regardless of what they say. They understand that they can choose to participate in the conversation, but the conversation will go on unless they actually shut down the internet itself, which has tremendously negative economic consequences for any country. They understand that smarter government uses new technologies like virtualization. Now, this is a very IT signing crowd, so you know about desktop virtualization. If you don't know about platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, you know about software as a service, you know all the flavors of cloud, public cloud, private cloud, so we won't talk about it much more. We'll let you all do that at the ICT Summit. But you know that this is a very important part of the future of computing, and it's a less expensive way to do certain things. Not all, but certain. You also know that 21st century smarter government is more open. Fundamentally, it is open and accountable to the people. It embraces the principle that what is public is online. It embraces the principle that what is open should be by default. It embraces the principle that government is supposed to be representative of the people and accountable to the people. Government is real time. Understands that citizens need to make decisions in real time. The private sector is enabling that. And that anything that is less than that is lagging what's actually happening in the real world. You cannot deny that when you look at what's happening in social media and you see the problems that people are having in real time. It's also right time. It's no longer just about saying what's happening now. It's saying, can I get information about something when I need to? This is a life-saving application developed by a fire department in California. It tells people through the 911 dispatcher that someone nearby them is having a heart attack. And then pins the people who have the right certification to operate an automatic electronic defibrillator to find the nearest defibrillator and bring it to that person and shock them. If you shock someone in the first 10 minutes after they have a heart attack, their survival rate skyrocket. It's no longer just about real-time government, it's about right-time government. Connecting citizens to each other in need. 
government is citizen centric. It's not just what that wants to do. It's understanding that citizens come to government that, and they want to do things. How do you create sites and services that enable them to do the things that they want and create those sites and, that are built around that, that are built around search, that are built around the most popular things? This is gov.uk. This is the UK's new stat of this specific idea. This is also open source if you want to take their idea and apply it in your own country. Mm -hmm. Government also represents something important. Protection of the people's right to speak. Protection of the media's right to report what they need to report. If you want to have a free and open society, you have a free and open media that respects freedom of speech. If we all can publish, then all of our speech has to be protected. And believe me, this is something that we have challenges with in my country as well. Government is searchable. You create new interfaces and new opportunities for people to search for information when they need to. It's financial advisors. You don't lock the information into a tiny website that no one knows how to find it. You make it possible for people to get information about the, those who manage their money wherever and whenever they need it. Government accepts that people have ownership of their own data. Data that's collected about them from companies or about their uh, other activities by the companies, energy companies, or data that's collected about them by government. Say health data that's collected uh, by have, their behalf by the Veterans Department. And it says that you own this data, you have a right to get it, we're going to give it to you in a machine readable format so you can do useful things for it with it and plug it into services that help make you help enable you to make better decisions. Government helps the citizens who need it most. In this conversation, we must make sure that we are enabling not just the richest people in society who can afford smartphones and data plans, not just people who have broadband internet access, but those people who are being left behind by the digital revolution. People who don't have access to the internet, who just have a basic feature phone, who maybe don't have a phone at all. How society helps those who have least amongst the people is a measure of how good that society is. I fundamentally believe that. And it is your choice as government and as civil society, as a private sector, to actually act upon that. Government that uses smarter systems, smarter technologies, understands that when they go to give citizens the opportunity to participate online, this interaction has to matter. If you keep asking people to do things, there has to be a reason for it, and action has to happen. This is a platform of Latvia. It's actually enabled through the same kinds of encryption and security that you would use for banking, and enable citizens to vote upon different measures that then go before their parliaments. Now, you've heard from IBM about cities and smarter cities and sensors. This is something that's important. Smarter cities, smarter governments understand that there are many other new ways of collecting data, and those kinds of data can be used to actually understand the infrastructure of the cities, from the water to the electricity to the ways that the utilities interoperate to the traffic, et cetera. These actually offer new opportunities to monitor gather data that help the cities make better resource allocation decisions, such as smarter community, right? Government has smarter infrastructure. These sorts of decisions can help actually help reduce pollution. You reduce the amount of congestion, you reduce the amount of time cars are idling, you improve fuel efficiency. Data can help you make those decisions. Citizens, however, also act as sensors. It's not just about the uh, Internet of Things, it's about people, you know, Internet of People, right? In India, you have people who are taking pictures of their streets and, and sending them into government. If a vendor who is supposed to clean the streets is not clean the streets, those pictures report from the citizens whether it's been done, the fine is levied against the vendor, the vendor pays, pays for the program of citizen reporting, and the loop continues. These positive feedback loops are part of the smarter government for the 21st century. They are ways that government uses citizens and sensors and all the data exhaust flowing into the world to understand what's happening more quickly and make faster policy decisions. We all know the pace of change has sped up. We all know the pace of technology and disruption has vastly increased over the past 10 years. If government is going to stay current, it must create better feedback loops between those who are governed and those who are governing, those who make policy and those who have the policy effects, those who create regulations or laws, and the people who understand how they will affect them. If these loops are not created, you will see bad policies, bad laws, and bad regulations. Again, my country has experience with this. I tell you, living in Washington, we have our fair share of those issues.
These systems create new opportunities for network accountability. This is a map of radiation data in Japan that took place after the uh, tsunami wrecked a uh, nuclear power plant. This data is collected by both citizens and government, and then released online. So people could see collectively where radiation was uh, actually moving. Something that was, in fact, of great interest to many citizens. Now, this process is often referred to as open innovation. We'll hear about, more about open innovation from the World Bank. This idea that if you create things with citizens, they can become better. This is not just about government, though. Often we hear about this, is talked about as crowdsourcing, right? The idea that you work with a distributed group of people to divide up work. You can do that in government by creating better vehicles. You can do that in academia by trying to find things more quickly. This is MIT's Red Balloon Project. They released nine of these around the United States. They found them within nine hours. Increasingly, this project is actually, this process is called citizen sourcing, though, right? Working with citizens to create better government. Understanding that they can help each other, they can help government itself. This is a perfect example of how the internet plus citizen sourcing plus a government agency thinking differently could achieve this kind of aim. This is a mortgage disclosure form, something anyone in the United States has to complete in order to apply for a mortgage for a house. It's a big moment in any citizen's life. It's the biggest purchase they make. Now, our new agency, our startup agency in Washington, D.C., the CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, put this form online and used heat map to see what people looked on and clicked on. They then used all that data to build a better mortgage disclosure form that was more easy to understand so that citizens in their daily lives, when they did this very important thing, could understand the form itself. Fundamentally, smarter government is not just about any one of these things. It's about them all together. It's understanding, as we look back, many centuries ago to the Magna Carta, one of the first documents that affirmed that the rights of the people matter. Then this moment, it's not simply government by the people, for the people. It's government with them. It's governing with the citizens themselves. It's enabling them to use all the tools they have in their hands. It's working with civil society. It's working with your partners in the private sector. It's working with other governments in these networks of networks to improve society, to work on the stuff that matters, to build applications that aren't about the next social gizmo but about helping people make better decisions in their everyday lives. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you, and I thank you for your time today. Alex, thank you uh, very, uh, very much for that. Um, an enormous uh, score of innovative ideas from all around the world. There, which, is, uh, which is fascinating how it's cut up in different cultures and different skill levels and, uh, and, 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 and so on. By the way, uh, for those who haven't found it, uh, if you're on Twitter, the hashtag for the day is hash OpenMD. Uh, and uh, I see Alice's uh, talk reported there. Um, moderators throughout the day, uh, if you've got sort of questions that uh, you don't feel brave enough to stand up and ask yourself, uh, then put it on uh, Twitter with the hashtag OpenMD and the moderators will, will pick that up and, and, and be able to use that. Um, so, to put alongside Alex's talk, there's a worldwide um, uh, view of open government and open data. Uh, one of the, the key messages that uh, I see in looking at successful and the other initiatives is the importance of political leadership uh, in that and, and, and pushing it through. And so it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Mr. Rodrigo, the Secretary General of the uh, World Open Government, to talk about Moldova's e governance, the e governance transformation.
much longer, even when you will not be here in Moldova. I particularly liked the slide when you showed the government office with a bunch of papers on it. It looks like my office perfectly. I can tell you that uh, State Chancellor yearly uses like 30 tons of papers, and most of it goes to my desk. So, where we are? All of us. And uh, before going to start my presentation, I'll have uh, a remark. Uh, my presentation is in English, but it's not particularly meant for our partners who are here to help us to streamline and to guide through this uh, ICT transformation agenda. Uh, it's from all of us, but it's still in English, because English is a language which connects us. It's a language, it's a must actually in, in this world. And I would really like the mass media, the civil society of Moldova, to actively participate in this summit because it gives a lot of opportunities for them to understand how together the government and the citizens will change our life. So where we are? We are a very well-connected society. Uh, we have 92% internet penetration, uh, mobile penetration, we have 42% internet penetration, we have 60% of rural internet users. It means our Bunikutsele uh, she Bunyei stays online on Skype with their fellows in Italy or other, uh, other places. So we have all the necessary prerequisites to move forward, but if the government does not respond to this, then these things cannot be changing. So we have to wisely uh, uh, use these endowments in, in our advantage. And government has to understand that it has to be connected with their citizens, it has to offer services online, and we don't have to ask ourselves any longer, because I still hear these questions in, in, within the government. How, if we offer the uh, electronic service, how the citizens, all the citizens will use it? It's no longer an issue, because as I said, we have people, around 60% of rural, in rural areas, which are online. So it's our responsibility to make the government more transparent, more accountable, more efficient, more spreading, and more transparent. What we did so far? Well, two years ago, I remember a team of uh, very idealistic people in the government, led by Stella Mokan, by Donna Shola, who just left, a few others, who said that this is the only way to move forward. We need to use ICT in order to improve, first of all, the delivery of services to citizens, but also to make things within the government work better. So two years ago we established the e-government center with the help of our colleagues from World Bank and this was the beginning of our uh, e-transformation journey. Uh, furthermore, last year we approved the strategic program for modernization and if you see the key words here are public services, open government, the re-engineering of public services, accountability and so forth. So that means that we exactly understand what needs to be changed within the government. But again, we cannot do it by ourselves. We, we have to be together with you, with civil society. We have to make, make partnerships with private companies, with media, and so on. What are the objectives of e-governance transformation? We engage ourselves that by 2020, all the public services should be digitalized. This is not over ambition and the plan. It's uh, our pledge actually to, uh, towards the EU integration. Uh, and uh, by 2020, uh, more than 500 plus services, which right now government is delivering to its citizens, must be digitalized and it will be digitalized. Uh, also, that we share that uh, the vision that the open government data must be a default in the government, and all the uh, uh, 
data which is available for, for, for the government use should be available for its citizens. And the picture shows very well. We have today queues, we have today bureaucracy, and this can be excluded only by uh, digitalizing the services which are offered by the government. Efforts are today. In green you see already services which uh, started to be uh, digitalizing and will be delivered uh, rather soon. And the plan uh, uh, is by 2013 to have all these services which you have here uh, uh, to be digitalized and be offered uh, for the citizens. The, the pace of or the speed is uh, slow yet. Uh, for the next year you see around like 12, 12 services to be delivered. But incrementally we have to increase the speed and again uh, this could be done only by partnering with private sector, with civil society, mass media and all the citizens. A must for, for, for our uh, journey or for delivering services to the citizens is uh, there are some horizontal uh, issues. First of which is identification. As uh, Alex said in his presentation, the most important uh, tool which everyone has, and I said in Moldova, mobile penetration is like 92%, is having the uh, identification through the mobile phone. Uh, I'm glad to announce that uh, two months ago we signed uh, a partnership with uh, three major uh, uh, mobile operators, the only operators in, in Moldova, uh, Molcel, Orange and Mol Telecom. And uh, hopefully by the fall we will have in place a mobile identification platform which will allow the pe people to identify themselves and to uh, uh, get the services from the uh, state or uh, any other, other private services. Of course, uh, there are other uh, ways of, of uh, uh, identification as well. Another ho horizontal uh, issue is the payment gateway. And in this case, we engaged uh, with the help of the national bank, the commercial banks, uh, to have a platform for uh, making possible all the payments through that platform, both for uh, private services by the banks or by other institutions, but most importantly for the state services. As you can see, the uh, penetration of the banking cards in Moldova is quite high, but only 5% of the transactions uh, are cashless. People in Moldova are used to, to go to the ATM, withdraw the cash and use it. We want to shift this uh, approach, and since the, the, the banking cards are uh, around 1 million, we want to make people staying at their home or in bars or in cafes and receiving their services right at the place where they are. Again, as uh, we saw in the previous presentation, uh, a shared technological platform is something which should allow the government to improve its internal uh, uh, interaction. And uh, uh, shared government infrastructure will ensure sustainability and security for e-government uh, uh, system. Uh, we don't want to spend more money on uh, buying hardware, we want to invest those money in innovations. Therefore, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the clouding or the digitalization of the uh, uh, platforms which are used uh, within the government uh, is uh, something which, again, we are uh, on the track and hopefully by towards the end of the year we will have already the first phase of the uh, modern cloud platform. What we need so far? Okay, there are three pillars on which we concentrated, on open government data, on open public expenditure and improved public services. We started with the open government data uh, in 2011, uh, when this initiative was only uh, discussed by a number of countries, US, Brazil and others. And uh, in, 2000, in April of 2011 we launched the, the uh, uh, portal datigov.md, which allowed the ministries to public a number of data sets which then 
have been used by the uh, private sector to develop a number of applications. Uh, the next uh, important step we did is op uh, opening the uh, public expenditure database boost. Uh, those of you who are interested to know and to learn about this further, uh, in the session two we will have representatives from the Minister of Finance and will give an overview because we were the, the, the one among the first countries to show uh, what exactly are expenditures, not, not the budget figures, you know that the state budget is approved, everyone has access to it. Actually, you can see what was the expenditure or how the money had been used and to see how efficiently those money had been used. And last but most least, uh, last week uh, the Prime Minister uh, uh, participated in the inauguration of our uh, uh, service portal. Uh, so far, uh, we have 136 uh, uh, services, actually, it's more because every day it's, it's, it's moving. And it's the checkpoint for all the public services offered by all the state institutions. So ideally in the future you will not need to, to queue or to look for a service in different websites of the different authorities. You go to this checkpoint, you find the application forms, you will be able to pay for the services and uh, get the service at, at wherever you are without going to the authority. Uh, as I said, the Open Government uh, initiative is very important for, for us. We uh, launched the portal in uh, April 2011, but most importantly we become a, a part of the global initiative uh, uh, which was uh, uh, signed by a, a number of countries uh, in Brazil this year and this was possible only by approving the concrete uh, action plan uh, for opening the, the data of the government which has three major pillars or grand challenges. It's increasing public integrity, better managing public resources and improving public services. Well, in conclusion, the journey is long, as somebody said today morning. Uh, we need your help, we need your assistance, we need to learn the best experience from our partners. And what we heard today uh, from Alex, a very refreshing themes and uh, directions where we have to think about is something which uh, will help us to deliver better, citizens, better services to our citizens and to make the government close to their citizens. Thank you. Deci, sare și privești, de ce 
Trebuie, într-adevăr, să avem un guvern smart, deștept. Sau există o într-adevăr voință politică pentru a fi guvernați într-un mod deștept. Mai mulți ani urmă, cred că noi cinci care în urmă, am fost membru a unui juriu într-o organizație care era donator. Tădea grantul pentru literii proiecte. Și atunci, la acel juriu, am discutat foarte contradictor un proiect interesant, mi se părea atunci. Unul din scopurile principale ale cărora era să ajute instanțele de judecată să distribuie în mod întâmplător cazurile către judecători. Argumentarea era următoare, deoarece instanțele nu au calculatoare, nu posedă tehnologii așa, mai moderne, ele nu pot distribui întâmplător dosarele, cazurile către judecători. Am mirat foarte mult atunci acest lucru, pentru că o pălărie este cel mai simplu și cel mai de nădejde, de fapt, instrument pentru a distribui cazurile în mod întâmplător către judecători. Dar am aprobat atunci acest proiect. Pentru că, iată, și pe 5 ani de zile, de fapt, să ne jucăm, să observăm că problema persistă. Nu calculatorul era problemă, de fapt, și nici părerea nu era problemă, ci voința politică de a distribui, într-adevăr, în mod întâmplător, acele dosare, în instanță, către judecător. Și, ca să fac o concluzie puțin mai largă, de fapt, voința politică lipsește pentru a ne face guvernarea, într-adevăr, mai deșteaptă. Așa cum a fost aici demonstrat foarte simplu, că aceste instrumente pot ajuta guvernarea. Ele pot ajuta enorm guvernarea. Dar dacă nu există această voință politică de a folosi în mod judicios și corect aceste instrumente, noi nu vom avea o guvernare deșteaptă, smartă. Pentru că, și acum vreau să vedem câteva exemple. Am fost implicat în mai multe discuții, în ultimul timp, privind o lege controversată a Marii Publicului Mărău, dar Guvernul și-a asumat responsabilitatea sa apropie și nu au apropie. De vreo patru ani de zile. Legea se numește antidiscriminare. Îi trebuie Guvernului calculatoare ca să vorbe această lege. Îi trebuie tehnologie informațională. Eu personal am beneficiat foarte mult în accesul la internet. Pentru că, încercând să mă documentez, găsesc că Franța a reformulat această lege antidiscriminare pe o pașină și jumătate de text pe A4, format A4, cu fondul 12 și include în ea tot definiția discriminării, toate criteriile de discriminare, pedepsele pentru persoane juridice și pedepsele pentru persoane de juridice. Or la noi, legea are pe o 15 pagini și nu include nimic decât mențiunea că Guvernul, după aprobare legei, va interi cu propunere de a modifica codul contra pensii administrative, codul penal, construzii penale, etc., pentru a completa această legislație. Deci, nu ai simțit lipsește. Lipsește voința politică. Și un alt exemplu. În 2008, Parlamentul a adoptat legea privind conflictul de interes. În 2008. Cu o clauză în care a obligat Guvernul și Parlamentul să elaboreze un mecanism pentru încredarea acestei legislații, mecanismul inclusiv și așa numit la Comisia Națională de Integritate. Până acum, 2008-2012, sunt patru ani, trei guvernări, 
până acum nu există acest mecanism. Poate trebuia tehnologii foarte avansate pentru a aproba conferența cei Comisia Nesuale de Integritate. Sigur că noi, cetățenii, am beneficia enorm dacă o semne cu Comisia exista, dar ea, într-adevăr, ar publica toate datele privind titlurile oficiale lor, dacă toată lumea avea acces la acele date, cred că ar exista o presiune enormă din partea societății pentru a combate corupție. Acesta este un instrument foarte important, dar, încă o dată, nu tehnologiile informaționale sunt piedică în adoptarea unor semne de lege. Apropo, combaterea corupției, mă amintesc proaga lui participanți din alte părți la acest summit se vor vera sau vor râde, dar unul din primiștii, ca alte recenți, adoptase o decizie cu conferea veniturile membrilor guvernului sunt declarate top secret. Este joc. Mă dă joc, tu o să care eu îți trece. Deci, eu cam astea am vrut să spun aici, că fără voință politică, nimic nu ne poate ajuta. Calculatorul va sta pe masă, cum am văzut în unele administrații locale, acoperite cu așa o perteluță frumoasă cu porcoțită și portată rațional, monitorul ca să se potrească și nu vor folosi la nimic, dacă într-adevăr nu există voință Facebook. 
So the, the major uh, challenge for the government is to align the, the people within the government with the people outside of the government. Because at the end of the day, it's, as, as uh, Alex said, is the government, but government is by the people, for the people, but it should be with the people. Because these people elected the government. So it's a big challenge. This is the only comment which I will stop by now and we'll see maybe somebody wants to come in from the stage. Okay, any, any questions or points from the, the floor? Those are going to be exposed by those governments. 
but they do not in and of itself make the government more accountable unless it wants to be. That's something that citizens in those countries have to demand. And I would argue that we're seeing them do that as they get more access to how corrupt their governments are around those same places you mentioned, from Africa to Asia uh, to South America. The more that this kind of technology-fueled citizen uh, ownership of government sweeps in these places, the more we'll see disruption because these societies have traditionally not have had access to information. So the disruptions will be much greater than maybe in countries that have established parliaments and rights to information. And I think, I think we'll see that in our screens and on our televisions. Andrew, I would like just to add something uh, to, to my first comment. Uh, E-governance in Moldova, e-transformation, is part of the broader central public administration reform. Uh, so we, what we envisage simply is not to digitalize certain services which are provided now to the citizens. I said that uh, currently the government, through all the agencies, offers 500 plus services to its citizens. Simply digitalizing those bad services or services which don't, don't need to, to, to be there is not, it's not a solution. So re-engineering of, of all the uh, systems and the, uh, cutting uh, or guillotining some of the services which are provided is part of the, of the, uh, of the agenda. So e-transformation or e-governance in Moldova is part of the broader central and local public administration reform in order to, to make Change not as as I just said, just putting uh, people or opening set, certain sets of data. This is not the, the there is no use of it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Just Hi, my name is uh, Justin. I'm a South African and I'm a journalist. Um, so I'm going to be speaking from a media perspective, but um, the comments also apply across the board. Um, to many of these open data initiatives that we see, they seem to be supply driven. So the first, the priorities are to release information that government thinks is important to their citizens. And um, the question is, have you reached out to Moldovan citizens to find out what they prioritize as the most important information first? So from a media perspective, for example, um, company records, your shareholder and your registrar companies in Moldova would be an essential resource for any transparent government initiative. In Moldova at the moment, I understand it's not on the list of priorities for, for opening up as part of open data, and in fact the public is charged to get information. So that's very difficult for any watchdog organization then to see who's receiving tenders, who's involved in any kind of procurement process. And that is something that should be prioritized at least from a media and a social justice and um, oversight uh, priority level. Thanks. Thank you, and it's good to see you here in Kishinev, we met in Washington. We promise that you will be here. Thank you for coming. Indeed, it's, uh, it's a very important question. How we come up to the list of those services which we want in the first place to digitalize? Uh, of course, we made our internal analysis, but most importantly is what uh, we do with, the, with our civil society. So we are constantly in contact with them through, through all the social uh, media and uh, uh, networks in order to get the feedback what is more, more important. The issue which you mentioned, it's, it's uh, uh, not in, uh, you haven't seen it in a priority here, but it's in the uh, sectoral priority of the Ministry of Economy. When we came into the government two years ago, two major uh, things were not available for regular citizens, which have the right according to the Constitution to have access to. First was the legal database. Uh, you, we had a very slow uh, interface with the Minister of Justice and it didn't work and it was not updated. Now all the legal database is available online, every citizen has access to it and it works quite well. And the second priority was uh, the, the register. Unfortunately, yes, you're right, it's still, you have to pay to get some uh, uh, data for it. It's open, I mean, everyone can get it. But you need to pay for this uh, uh, service, and uh, uh, I know that the Minister of Economy is uh, envisages to, to put it uh, open, or open and all that, because it, it's a it's a must tool for any start of any investigation or any analysis, either on business or on media side. 
I learned more about the flow of the blood in here. I had some opportunity to learn about the history of this country. And it struck me that it's a landlocked nation, does not have the great mineral resources that some uh, other countries have for their good or ill. It does not have the industrial capacity that other countries do. But what it does have is an extremely literate population. It does have is a people who want to become part of the global conversation. And it strikes me that if you want to say what the start of that open government process should be, it is investing in the intellectual capacity of the country, in the literacy, the digital sense, literacy of the educational sense, um, and providing people with the tools to hold their governments accountable and to build better lives for themselves and their children. Um, and that means that uh, they need to have uh, their rights respected. Uh, they need to be able to have, have a right to ownership of property, of, of intellectual property content. It's a very controversial issue. Um, and that they need to have their right to speak the truth to power respected. Uh, there's no question that there's a very long road ahead for that. And that there are countries where journalists who pursue that kind of work are silenced in the most extreme fashion. And some of those countries aren't very far from here. And I know, studying the history of this country, that there was an empire which dominated it not so long ago, where if you were a dissident and spoke to, to power and exposed to corruption by the state or by its partners, that you experience consequences. Um, there's no question to me that building a more open government means including the people, and not simply imposing what government thinks is best, but what asking, you know, it means asking the leaders of society what they should do. And we're going to have an opportunity to see what that looks like in practice, in Egypt, and in Tunisia, maybe in other countries in that part of the world. And you'll see our own challenges in the United States as we face our own issues with money and politics, and with our national security state. For us, when the government runs up against the needs of the government to uh, protect us, right, for our own good, there are lessons there, right? Uh, every, every government uh, needs to see where the people are invested in it and to see what they're asking for and to make sure that members of the media who understand the long context are able to ask the questions of people in power, not just simply parroting what they say. I mean, my, my final thought on that is actually that there are three things about you know, the smart government and the open government. It's government being more open, it's citizens engaging, and then it's government behaving differently as a result. And we're now seeing a number of governments and administrative regional administration on the world you know, saying that they're open, opening up to make issues. In fewer, we're seeing citizens engaging, and that's Quite a priority, but still, it can be quite hard to see in most countries how the government at the visceral level of the individual bureaucrat is behaving differently as a, as a result. I would only add what uh, Mr. Barbaro just said without political will and leadership on both government, civil society, and business, there is no way how to improve things. Okay. Thank, uh, uh, thank you, panel. Uh, thank you, audience. Um, we've now got the uh, coffee break. There's some refreshments outside. And I think we'll uh, start again at 11 o'clock. Uh, we've got a very full session on open government after, after the break. Thank you, and see you again in the comments.
I hope you will put your head as organizer the whole week and uh, explain why this ecosystem is important, right? Because it's the only opportunity to talk about the innovation, open innovation week. It's a new program. Yeah? Because I cannot talk about it because I'm not, I'm not a speaker. So you are the only person. I'm talking on behalf of civil society. Like, You're talking about civil society. Yes, but you yes, also are partnering. I was asked as a civil society. Yes, member. civil society to build an ecosystem around exactly. open government. Exactly. And I'm going to share how this can yeah. be done. Because there, yeah. is a, there, there is a tool which is National Council for Participation. Yeah. One of the so you want to talk about OGP, action I plan? I will talk about the role of, of civil society in OGP through the National Council for Participation. Through the National Council for Participation. Exactly. This is very good. And uh, you will not talk about the uh, AFSA Moldova Open Innovation no. Weekend. Who's going to talk about it? Oh, I will refer to that when I am chairing the third session. Okay. Okay. Good, good. So very good. My message is just okay, so right now you're focusing on the OGP, OGP uh, and the role of the side. Выберем кадр. 
Они будут стоять.
Давай посмотрим, как там
Yeah.